Unit 6. Summary Listening activity number 1. You are going to hear a talk about security in the UK. Listen to the talk and complete the statements below by writing no more than three words in the spaces provided. In large cities, for instance London, and crowded places such as airports and stations, there is the risk of theft. We do not want you to suffer the distress of losing important documents and valuables as soon as you step onto British soil. So here are some important do's and don'ts. Don't carry more cash than you need for daily expenses. If you stay at a hotel, do ask the manager to keep large sums of cash, documents and valuables in the hotel safe and give you a receipt for them. This is a free service. If cash is stolen, it is very unlikely to be recovered. Do keep separately a note of the serial numbers on your traveller's cheques, so if they are lost you can inform your bank. Do take particular care of bank and credit cards. Do carry wallets and purses in an inside pocket or a handbag. Don't ever leave a bag unattended and make sure it is securely fastened when you are carrying it. Do carry jewellery and valuables such as cameras, radios and typewriters on you or with you and keep a note of any serial numbers. Do take special care of your passport, travel tickets and other important documents. Documents are at risk particularly at airports and stations where it is obvious that most people will be carrying them. Do make a note and keep it in a safe place of the number of your passport, its date and place of issue. This makes replacement easier if you are unlucky enough to lose it. If you don't want to carry heavy luggage around with you, you can leave it in a luggage office at most large stations and pick it up later. Keep the receipt so that you can reclaim your luggage. Check the opening hours or you may find your luggage locked away when you need it again. If you lose any of your luggage in transit, take this up immediately with the officials of the airline or shipping line. But don't worry too much. 98% is found within three days. If you lose anything, go first to the lost property office at the airport or station, as it may have been found and handed in. If you lose your luggage in the street or suspect it has been stolen rather than gone astray, find the nearest policeman who will advise you what to do. Listening activity number two. You're going to hear a lecture on some useful information for your travelling around Britain. Listen to the first part of the lecture and complete the notes below by writing no more than three words in the spaces provided. Good afternoon and welcome to the session on Britain. This afternoon I would like to provide some useful information for you about travelling around Britain. Britain has over 700 tourist information centres. You will find them at major ports, airports, stations, historic landmarks and towns and holiday centres. So just look out for this sign that says tourist information. The staff will be able to answer your holiday queries as well as provide essential maps, guides and brochures. Tourist information centres at major ports and airports in London and addresses of British Tourist Authority European offices are all listed on the tourist information centres. Now let's talk about the telephone in Britain. You know, Britain is well supplied with public telephones. Street kiosks take ten pence coins. In city centres, mainline railway stations, airports and central London underground stations, payphones and card phones are in operation. For the latter, small plastic phone cards are used, and these come in 10, 20, 40, 100 and 200 units, and can be bought at post offices, news kiosks, station bars and shops where the green and white card phone sign is displayed. When using the different public telephone systems, make sure you read the dialing instructions carefully. Now, let's see the banks in Britain. There are 24-hour banks at London's two main airports. One is Heathrow and the other is Gatwick. Otherwise, banks are normally open from 9.30 to 15.30 hours, Monday to Friday. Barclays Bank and National Westminster Bank offer a Saturday morning service at some of their branches. 
National Jara Bank has 42 bureaux de change located in post offices throughout the country in main tourist areas. Opening hours are nine o'clock to 17:30 weekdays, nine o'clock to 12:30 Saturday mornings. One exception to this is the Trafalgar Square office, whose opening hours are eight o'clock to 20 o'clock weekdays and Saturdays, and 10 o'clock to 17 o'clock on Sundays. The Bureau de Change services are available to overseas visitors. Visitors can change their money there. You can also change money at Bureau de Change, large hotels, department stores, and travel agents. Be sure to check in advance the rate of exchange and the commission charged, as these vary considerably. Wherever possible, you are advised to use a bank or bureau de change, which conforms to the BTA code of conduct. In most cases, this is indicated by display of the code. Listening activity number three. Now listen to the second part of the lecture. As you listen, complete the notes below by writing no more than three words in the spaces provided. Now let's turn to shopping, which may interest you more. In general, shops open at nine o'clock in the morning and close at five thirty in the afternoon. In country towns and quieter suburbs. Smaller shops close for an hour at lunchtime, and once a week there tends to be an early closing day, when most shops shut during the afternoon. Many cities have a late night once a week when shops stay open until approximately eight o'clock in the evening. You should ensure that anything you bring into the country, such as travelling irons, heated rollers, hair dryers, and electric shavers, can be used on the standard British voltage. Which is 240 volts, 58 Z. Many hotels will, on request, be able to supply adapters for electric shavers. When you travel, you may want to send postcards home. Stamps can be bought at post offices throughout Britain. They are open from nine o'clock to five thirty Monday to Friday, and until twelve thirty on Saturday. Stamps can also be bought at postal centre stamp dispensers. At large stores and major tourist attractions, for posting letters, you don't have to go far before finding a red painted letter box. Alternatively, use the letter boxes at post offices. You may ask how much to tip in hotels and how much it is for a taxi. There are no fixed rules on tariffs about this, and the following is intended only as a guide to customary practice. Most hotel bills include a service charge. Usually 10 to 12 percent, but in some larger hotels, 15 percent. Where a service charge is not included, it is customary to divide 10 to 15 percent of the bill among the staff who have given good service. In restaurants, if a service charge is not included in the bill, then 10 to 15 percent is usually left for the waiter. For porters, we usually give 30p to 50p per suitcase. For taxis. Ten to fifteen percent of the fare. Hairdressers, two pounds according to how much work they have done, plus fifty p to the assistant who washed your hair. If you drive in Britain, you should remember to drive on the left and overtake on the right. The wearing of seat belts is compulsory for the driver and front seat passengers. Now let's talk about full details of Britain's road regulations. A copy of the Highway Code. Can be obtained from offices of the Automobile Association (AA) or Royal Automobile Club (RAC) at most ports of entry. These two motoring organisations can also provide plenty of helpful information to all motorists. Contact AA. Telephone is o one eight five four seven three seven three. Twenty four hour service. RAC telephone is. O three O four two zero four two five six, twenty four hour service. For something more serious, telephone operators will give you the telephone number and address of a local doctor's surgery. Alternatively, you can go to the casualty department of any general hospital, or, in the case of severe emergency, dial nine nine nine. Nine 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 is free.
Remember, unless you belong to a European Community country or one with which the UK has reciprocal health arrangements, you will be charged for the full cost of medical treatment in Britain, except in the case of accidents or emergencies requiring outpatient treatments only. It would therefore be wise to take out full medical insurance before leaving home. Listening activity number four. You are going to hear a dialogue between two students talking about how Parliament makes new laws. As you listen, complete the notes below by writing no more than three words in the spaces provided. Hi there, Alison. How are you getting on with your tutorial paper? Oh, I haven't finished yet. Chris, could you tell me how Parliament makes new laws? This may help for my tutorial next week. Okay, I'll be glad to help. You know, new laws can start in either the House of Lords or the House of Commons. They are usually proposed by the government, although they may be proposed by ordinary members. A law which is being proposed is called a bill until it is passed. Then it becomes an act of Parliament. I see. What is the procedure that a bill has to go through? The bill first of all goes through its first reading, as we call it. This just means that the title of the bill is announced and a time is set for it to be discussed. Yes, and then what is the next stage? And the bill will go through the second reading, which is really the debate stage. The bill may be rejected at this stage. If it is an important bill, this may cause the government to resign. On the other hand, it may be passed, or there may be no vote. If the bill is passed, what will happen? If the bill is passed, it goes on to the committee stage, where a small group of members meet and discuss it in detail. Do all the members have to attend the meeting? It depends. For certain important bills, the whole house can turn itself into a committee, which means that the detailed discussion is carried on by all the members. When the committee has finished its work, it reports the bill and with all the changes that have been made to the house. The bill is discussed again at this stage. To resign. If the bill is passed, what will happen? If the whole house can turn itself into a committee, Bill decides on what will become law and what will not. The bill becomes an act. And everyone, bill. the members, when the committee committee has committed, the, the bill becomes an act, and everyone, but the bill. A set royal game, 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 game. But this does not mean that the queen decides on what will become law and what will not. It is understood that the queen will always accept bills which both houses have passed. When the queen gives her assent, the bill becomes an act, and everyone that it affects must obey the new law. I see. Thank you for all that information. Listening activity number five. You are going to hear a talk about the English policeman. As you listen, complete the notes below by writing no more than three words in the spaces provided. The English policeman has several nicknames, but the most frequently used are Copper and Bobby. The first name comes from the verb to cop. Which is also slang, meaning to take or to capture, and the second comes from the first name of Sir Robert Peel, the nineteenth-century politician who was the founder of the police force as we know it today. An early nickname for the policeman was Peeler, but this one has died out. Whatever we may call them, the general opinion of the police seems to be a favourable one, except, of course, among the criminal part of the community, where the police are given more derogatory nicknames. Which originated in America, such as "fuzz" or "pig." Visitors to England seem nearly always to be very impressed by the English police. It has, in fact, become a standing joke that the visitor to Britain, when asked for his views of the country, will always say, at some point or other, "I think your policemen are wonderful." Well, the British Bobby may not always be wonderful. But he is usually a very friendly and helpful sort of character. A music hall song of some years ago was called, "If you want to know the time, ask a policeman." Nowadays, most people own watches, but they still seem to find plenty of other questions to ask the policeman. In London, 
The policemen spend so much of their time directing visitors about the city that one wonders how they ever find time to do anything else. Two things are immediately noticeable to the stranger when he sees an English policeman for the first time. The first is that he does not carry a pistol, and the second is that he wears a very distinctive type of headgear: the policeman's helmet. His helmet, together with his height. Enables an English policeman to be seen from a considerable distance, a fact that is not without its usefulness. From time to time, it is suggested that the policeman should be given a pistol, and that his helmet should be taken from him. But both these suggestions are resisted by the majority of the public and the police themselves. However, the police have not resisted all changes. Radios, police cars, and even helicopters give them greater mobility now. The policeman's lot is not an enviable one, even in a country which prides itself on being reasonably law-abiding. But, on the whole, the English policeman fulfills his often thankless task with courtesy and good humour, and with an understanding of the fundamental fact that the police are the country's servants and not its masters. Listening activity number six. You are going to hear a short talk about the banks in Britain. As you listen, complete the statements below by writing no more than three words in the spaces provided. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for turning up today for this short talk I'm going to give on student banking. Many of you are unfamiliar with the way banks work in this country, and today's talk should just give you a few starting points. Well, as you probably know, you'll need to open a bank account while you are here. The safest place to keep your money is a bank. Choose one that is near where you study. All the major banks in Britain offer special facilities for students, and will be only too happy to explain how to open an account. The most useful type of account is a current account. You can pay in money received in any form, and then draw it out when you need it by using your cheque book. Writing out cheques in their name can make payments to other people. If you want to draw out cash for yourself, make the cheque payable in your own name or to cash. A cheque crossed with two parallel lines is even safer, as it must be paid into a bank account. Payment by cross cheque has the added advantage that when the person to whom you have given the cheque presents it at a bank, it will eventually come back to your bank and provide proof of payment. Most people now ask their bank to supply only ready crossed cheques. Most banks don't make charges if you keep more than a certain amount of money in your account. However, you shouldn't overdraw on your account. That is, withdraw more money than you have in without the bank's permission. If you borrow money from the bank, there will be an interest charge. You will also have to pay a small charge to convert foreign currency paid into your bank into sterling. If you have more money than you need for month-to-month -month expenses. It is a good idea to open a deposit account for some of it, where it can earn interest. This interest is taxable, but if your bank knows that you are not normally resident in Britain, then you do not pay tax on it. You can't pay by cheque on a deposit account, and to withdraw money, you should give the bank seven days' notice, or you'll lose seven days' interest. When you have established yourself as a satisfactory customer with the bank, they can issue you a cheque card. This is really an identity card, which guarantees that correctly written cheques up to the value of fifty pounds will be honoured by the bank. A cheque card can be very useful, as many shops and enterprises, particularly in London and the cities, will not accept a cheque unless a cheque guarantee card backs it. You can also use it with your cheque book to draw up to fifty pounds cash from almost any bank in Britain. If you also ask for a euro cheque card. This can be used in the same way to draw cash from most banks in Europe. Many banks provide dispensing machines, generally set in the wall of the bank outside, where you can draw cash when the bank is crowded or closed. Provided you are a satisfactory customer, the bank can issue you a cash card, which allows you to draw up to one hundred pounds a day. Listening activity number seven. You are going to hear a talk about some British customs. 
listen to the talk and complete the notes below by writing no more than three words in the spaces. Good morning. My name is Marsha Smith, a counsellor here at the Student Services section of the university, and this morning I'd like to talk to you about visiting a British home. This may help you to cope well with your study and social life in Britain. There is a commonly quoted saying in Britain, "An Englishman's home is his castle," which sums up the importance we give to our own bit of private territory. If you are living in a British home or are invited to visit or stay with someone, it is important to act thoughtfully. For example, be punctual for meals, and if you know you have to miss one. Let your host know as soon as possible. Check whether it is convenient for others in the house when you wish to take a bath or wash and dry laundry. And unless your host employs someone to do the housework, you are expected to make your own bed and keep your room clean and tidy yourself. If you don't have a door key, remember to make arrangements if you intend to be out late, and keep your hosts informed of your whereabouts so they don't worry. These suggestions apply. Whether you're a guest or a lodger, and will help the household to run smoothly. If you're staying as a guest of a British family, or even visiting for one meal, it is customary to take a small gift of flowers, chocolates, or something to drink. Don't spend too much, as this could embarrass your hosts. If you're staying for several days as a guest, it is usual to give a small present when you leave. Usually, you will get onto first-name terms with people you meet. Quite naturally and quickly, if you're unsure, continue to use their family name, surname, and title until they ask you to use their first name. Older people and those with whom you have a more formal relationship may prefer to stick to surnames. For example, Doctor Smith or Mrs. Smith. If you're going to eat with British people or to stay with a British family, you may want to know if there are things that they normally do. Or don't do at the table. Rather than worry too much about rules, you may like to watch other people and copy what they do. It also helps to understand a few customs first. Both at home and in restaurants, people normally wait until everyone has got their food before they start eating. However, they will start before this if someone says, "Please don't wait" or "Don't let it get cold." When people have started, they keep their cutlery. Knives, forks, and spoons on the plate when they are not using them, and leave them on the plate when they finish the course. For each course, different cutlery is used. You may also notice that people don't usually spend much time at the table talking, drinking, and smoking. In fact, after dinner at home, it's fairly common for everyone to leave the table together and have coffee in the living room. If you are staying with a family or visiting informally. It's usual to offer to help with household chores, for example, clearing the table and washing up the dishes after a meal. Even men are expected to offer, though you may not be accepted. At a more formal meal, however, the host won't normally expect guests to help. Listening activity number eight. You are going to hear a series of lectures on Irish culture. Listen to the first part of the lecture. As you listen, complete the notes below by writing no more than three words in the spaces provided. River dance is an expression of modern Irish culture, but it is based on a culture which had its golden era from the sixth to the ninth century. Before that period, Irish culture was oral and based on a love of complicated stories and poetic styles. But in the sixth century, something wonderful happened. Writing was introduced by missionaries. From then on, the culture of Ireland began to develop in ways impossible before, and had considerable influence in northern Europe in the period up to the ninth century. With the invasions which began in the ninth century, this golden age collapsed, and there never was any real recovery. There were no wealthy kings to sponsor the poets and scholars. So the tradition survived only in a form which the peasants liked. The love of story and song did not die, but no real attempt was made to find a distinctive Irish style until the end of the nineteenth century, when Irish nationalism began to influence writers in English called Anglo-Irish literature. 
there are many famous writers from that period. There is also William Butler Yeats, George Bernard Shaw and Samuel Beckett, all of whom have received the Nobel Prize for Literature. In all, Ireland has received the Nobel Literature Prize four times. When you consider we have only a population half the size of Beijing, you see how unusual that is. Now, let me talk about the music. The Irish love of music has succeeded in surviving the change from Irish, the native language, to the language of the invader, and has once more begun to blossom and become influential outside the country. Irish music was reduced to being the language of the country people and was dying out as people moved to the cities. Young city people did not want to listen to peasant music, although we were all told it was important. Some efforts were made to make it attractive to city people, but largely without success. More recently, this has begun to change and since the 1980s has taken off. But modern Ireland has been looking for more than just a revival of traditional music. Many of the most famous popular singers in the world are Irish. U2, Enya, The Cranberries and many others. There are 10,000 people employed in Ireland in the music industry. River dance is an expression of that new interest in the old and that ability to understand the new. Listening activity number nine. Listen to the second part of our lecture. As you listen, complete the notes below by writing no more than three words in the spaces provided. River dance is not just an expression of self-confidence, a kind of culturally interesting pop song. It tells the story of a people through song and dance. It tells the story of the people whose spirit was broken by an event which occurred in the middle of the last century, but continued to affect the society until 1961, the Great Famine. What is a famine? In 1840, the official population of Ireland was 8 million. They were largely poor and living in the countryside. They were beginning to have an interest in independence, and perhaps had things been different, Ireland might have been independent much earlier. But there was a serious problem in the agricultural system. All crops were grown to pay the rent of the land, and all that was grown to eat was the potato. This was fine until the potato crop failed, as it did from 1845 to 1848. The stories of what happened in those times live on in the popular culture of Ireland, and I won't tell them here, but the result was that two million people died or left the country by 1851. When you realise that the population continued to go down until 1961, you can realise what a disastrous effect this famine had on the people. Compared with China, imagine if the famine of 1960 reduced the population by a quarter and it kept falling to less than half of its pre-famine figure. Anybody with ideas left and went to England, America or Australia. The people left behind were broken by their experiences and, in effect, the famine and its consequences put an end to all serious development in the country until well into this century. The Irish in Ireland lost all hope and self-confidence and much of our modern culture is about the sadness of that time and the sorrow of saying goodbye to those who left and left well into this century. Ireland has the highest emigration rate of any country in Europe for the last two centuries. We even have an expression for this saying goodbye. It is called the American Wake. It means the ceremony, like that of a funeral for someone going to America, because you will never see him or her again. Do you know why there is Irish music on the film Titanic? It is because most of the people killed were Irish. The leaving continued until the 1970s, because independence in 1921 was followed by a civil war and an economic depression. Almost every family in Ireland has relatives abroad, and up to the 60s in some places, of a class of 30 graduating from high school all left. Along the west coast, closed up houses from that time falling into ruin are still common. Listening activity number 10. 
Listen to the last part of the lecture. As you listen, complete the notes below by writing no more than three words in the spaces provided. Last time, I said that a lot of Irish people left the country and went to England, America, and many other foreign countries. Today, I'd like to talk about the emigration. The effects of immigration were not all bad. The immigrants experienced a lot of hardship in their new countries. There is a famous story about a park in Shanghai, where Chinese and dogs were not allowed. Well, in England, until into the 1950s, signs for jobs sometimes read. Irish need not apply. The immigrants often experience discrimination, but they form many organisations to look after their fellow immigrants. Many of these organisations later became very important. In America, the Irish chose politics as the way forward, and significant cities were controlled by Irish politicians. This movement reached its peak with the election of John F. Kennedy in 1960. His grandparents came from Ireland. And his election had a significant impact in Ireland, helping the process of recovery of self-confidence, which we have today. Today, there are 70 million people of Irish descent living outside Ireland. In America alone, there are 40 million people, and 10 million of these people have a hundred percent Irish background. They carried the culture of their home country with them and adapted it to their new home. They made changes. Which would be unthinkable in the home country, and we often laughed at the Yankees' Irishness. In fact, any immigrant who came back to live in Ireland, often after many years, found it very difficult to fit into Irish society again. They had been changed by the experience. These immigrants have always had an interest in the old country. The American letter was a letter containing dollars sent back to one's family. More recently, President Clinton. Has been very influential in bringing peace to the north of Ireland. River dance itself was the idea of a dancer who was American, who applied American methods to traditional dancing, and the fusion was immediately popular. Modern Ireland has been able to use the disaster of the last century to learn modern marketing techniques and apply them, without at the same time losing what is distinctive about itself. River dance is a demonstration of that distinctiveness.